Well, hello, Gathering Place family. Good to see you this morning. Well, at least see my screen, believing that you're there. Uh, welcome to More Than Sunday. Hey, I'm in uh, my house today. I've got a couple things going on this week. We had our 25th wedding anniversary, which is a huge deal. My wife stayed married to me for 25 years. Pretty amazing, huh? And I know some of you guys are thinking, wow, he's sure a catch. Well, let me tell you something. That's not why she stayed with me. It's by the grace of God. Also, it's because of this man, Robbie Booth, who took the time to invest into us and our marriage. And I want to say this, we have a conference with him coming up next weekend, February 20th. That's Saturday. You're all invited. We would love to have you come out for this marriage and relationship conference. You can find more information on our website, tgpchurch.com. And uh, I hope to see you there. Do whatever you can to be there. He'll also be with us on Sunday morning, just preaching to the whole congregation. Uh, but you are definitely going to enjoy it if you're able to make it out. Hey, I, I want to jump into the Word with you today. I don't have all my intros and outros, and I won't have all the scriptures to put up with you. Uh, you're just going to have to follow along on your Bible, and I trust that you will. I've been taking some time not only to celebrate our 25th year anniversary, but also, I moved my dad up to my hometown here in Folsom so that he's in a, an assisted living near us. It's an opportunity to really invest in that relationship and help take care of him in his latter years here. And so we've got a lot of things going on, and I didn't really have a lot of time to record this week, but I do want to get the word out to you. In light of all those things, I also have heard about three precious men of God who have uh, just been such a great example of faith and faithfulness who passed away within the past several weeks. Uh, one of them I've known for several years, uh, about 10 or 12 years, the other about eight years, and then one I just recently got to know. There's something about all three of these guys that as I heard their stories and, and even was able to visit two of them uh, during some of the times that they've been in the hospital or uh, in their home, uh, when, uh, what, what I found with all of them, they were full of faith. They were always full of hope. Anytime I would be talking to them, they'd be more concerned about me uh, or about others than what they're going through. They were precious men of God who loved people deeply, and all they wanted to do is uh, really see people come to know Jesus in the same way that they did. And so they deeply impacted my life, and, and some of them I had more time with than others, but when I look at their passing, when I hear the words that are spoken over them, I just think, man, for us as Christians, we have a lot of hope. We have a lot of uh, reason to live. We have a lot that God does on the inside of us. And I also listen to these stories and I think, I want to be like those guys. It also brings home the brevity of life, the reality that this life is short. So for all three of them, uh, it came earlier than anyone would expect. But the reality is we all know that day is coming. We all know that day is coming. And, and for each one of us, uh, today is one day closer to the day we stand before the Lord. And so as we've been in this message series talking about the believability of the Bible, we talked about the inspiration of the Bible. I just want to talk to you about some of the implications of that and what it, what it says and what we believe. Because if the Bible is true, and this life that we live is, is but a breath, it's but a vapor. There's certain things that we have to grab a hold of and be really firm in our understanding. And even just going back to what the early church believed, what the Bible teaches. And I want to walk you through some of that today. And I'll be glancing at my my uh, page here down. So if you're wondering, what is he looking at I'm, when I'm looking off camera? I'm not looking at my feet or my toes. Um, I'm actually just looking at what the scripture I put up on my screen. So, you know, when we think about this, we think about what did the early church believe? They were very well of their own mortality as well. Uh, but they also understood that though the life on this side of eternity is brief, we're all created to live forever. And there are certain things that they understood through the scriptures. They understood through their time with Jesus and through the revelation by the Holy Spirit that they passed on through those scriptures. Now remember, we believe the Bible. We believe it's a reliable collection of historical documents 
written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. And they report on supernatural events that were fulfillments of biblical prophecies. And they claim that their writings were not human, but rather divine in origin. And so when they're writing these things, they teach us certain things. And I want to go with you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is one of the core um, passages of the Bible that really summarize summarizes the gospel. In fact, sometimes people say this is the gospel in a nutshell. And this is really um, what we believe. It, it kind of encap encapsulates so much of what we believe. Now, I, I know there's so much more to the Bible than just this, but it's such a great foundation and almost an outline of the, the gospel message, at least. But believing the, the biblical gospel message is the only way that a person is saved. That's what we believe. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 and 2 says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul's writing to, the, to these uh, Corinthians, and he's saying this. He said, I want to remind you, I need to bring you back to the gospel that I preached to you. In times when... Uh, like what we live in today, where there's so much going on, oftentimes very chaotic, so many things changing and shifting around us, or just even in times when we're faced with our own mortality or the loss of life um, of a loved one, it's important for us to be reminded of what we believe. It's also important for us to be reminded of the gospel and what we believe in light of all the um, the pressure to believe a different gospel or to to really get off message, get off faith, to be distracted, to, to be divided. And, and and really, our faith is under fire so often. And I don't just mean like uh, the morals of this world, but really the foundations of our faith, what we believe and why we believe that. And so Paul's writing to some people who were struggling with their own mortality and eternity and trying to put all that together and says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. I've got to ask you this. How often are you reminded of the gospel? How often do you go back and bring it to memory, remind yourself, bring it to your memory again? We've got to get in the practice of doing this so that we are just solid because there are people who would have convincing arguments to try to undermine the word of God. So we have to be reminded of the gospel. And Paul says it like this. He says, the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are saved. So when he's saying this about the gospel, he's saying, this is the message that I preached. This is the message that you heard. And this is the message by which you are saved. It's an exclusive message saying that there's not, there's not many messages that will lead you to the path of salvation. There are not many roads that lead to heaven. There's only one. And he's saying, I want to remind you of this. This is the message by which you are saved. You are marching towards uh, <laughs> the gates of eternity. And this is the road to get into heaven right here. This message that I preached to you. Now, this isn't the only time that the scripture says that. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, Ephesians 1, 13, it says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So we're, we're sealed. We receive salvation after we hear the gospel and place our trust in that. You, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So the, the word of truth is the gospel of salvation. That gospel is the message of who Jesus is and what he's done. We'll get into that a little bit more. But it, the gospel, as revealed through the Bible, is what helps us to even understand who, uh, how to be saved. And then when we receive that, we believe it and we receive it, that's how we get saved. There isn't, uh, there, there, there aren't other ways to it. It's not through good deeds and good works. We'll talk a little bit about that, but it's this message right here. It's the message from the scripture. It's the message that is revealed that 
the church has always believed. They've never backed down from the the historic Christianity, the historic biblical approach here uh, to understanding salvation. We need to be reminded of it and, and bring it to our mind, our memory often. So that's what we believe. We believe that the biblical gospel message is the only way that a person is saved. When we are, when, when we are, um, faced with our own mortality. It's important to know that how do I prepare for eternity? That's what the, the gospel is trying to help you do and help us do, prepare for eternity. Uh, look at the person next to you and say, you aren't going to be around here forever, right? <laughs> don't, say, don't say that like with any mean intent, but just let them know. You're not going to be around here forever, but you will be somewhere. You are created spirit, soul, and body. Though your body might perish, will perish, uh, your spirit will live eterni for eternity. And the Bible teaches about heaven and hell. And uh, though we're not going to get into all of that today, it's important that we know how do we go to heaven. <laughs> so, second thing, we believe that we are born that we were born sinners, and that Christ died to atone for our sin. To atone means to as our substitute. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, he says this, Paul continued and he wrote this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He didn't die for uh, speaking truth to power. Sometimes people would try to mess with the message of the gospel and say the reason why Jesus died he died as a martyr because he was coming against the religious system he was coming against the oppressor he was coming and bringing this message of freedom and deliverance and he died because they didn't like his message now I understand there are many who didn't like his message and they were threatened and their power was threatened but that's not why Jesus died Jesus died to atone for our sins. Atonement means he, he was the substitute in place of our sins. Uh, we deserve to die, not him. But Jesus went to the cross for us, not because he was simply going to show us that by sacrifice is the way that we're to live or to lay your life down, that that's a, an example all of that is true that he was an example and that he did live a sacrificial life. But it was more than just that. It, there was a real need for atonement. In other words, the wages of sin is death. And for us, that penalty, there was a penalty for our sin. And Jesus paid it himself. According to the scriptures, this was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Now look back at Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, because this is something that's also important. And within progressive Christianity, for example, they, they are pulling away from the fact that Jesus was our substitutionary atonement, that he was that offering on our behalf. But Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds, we are healed. With his wounds, we are healed. And so all of this here was prophesied through the, the prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years in advance before Jesus went to the cross. Isaiah was seeing something happening on the cross with his spirit, with this prophetic eye that they didn't see happening with their physical eyes when it actually happened in person. But he was revealing the spiritual implications of what happened on the cross. Knowing this for us, when we look back on the cross, we don't just look at Jesus dying and thinking, well, that was really nice of him to do on our behalf or, or uh, as a as a light thing. I mean, the Bible says that he became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That the weight of the 
of the world's sin was laid upon him. It was a punishment. It was a punishment that was laid on Christ for us. We believe that. Now, why, why that's important is because if he didn't do that, we would still be responsible for it. And if we don't believe that he took it all himself, then we're saying that we are going to bear the responsibility and the weight. Now, when we die, if we haven't placed our faith and trust that Jesus has paid for that, then that means that we're going to have to pay for it. The problem with that is you will spend eternity paying for it and it will never be fully paid. This is, this is why Jesus went to the cross, to pay on your behalf. Now, why didn't he have to pay for it for eternity? He went and paid for it once and for all. He was the righteous dying for the unrighteous. So you would go as someone who's unrighteous and without the ability to ever pay it off. Jesus was without sin and he paid for it through his death on the cross. He was a substitutionary atoning sacrifice for you and me. As these three men that I, I mentioned, uh, men of God, they were precious on this side uh, of uh, eternity, full of life, full of hope, full of love, full of faith. And now that's only accelerated. Now they're standing in the presence of the Lord. Why? Not because they were good on this side. Their goodness on this side had nothing to do with them getting into heaven. It was everything. It had everything to do with Jesus on the cross, which really leads us to, we'll talk about this more in just a moment, but uh, we believe that Jesus was buried and was actually raised from the dead, was actually raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, uh, Paul goes on, he says, he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. It's not a metaphor that Jesus came to life just to tell us like, hey, after hard times, you know, there's hope for the future. It's not just a picture of better days ahead of us. We really believe that Jesus really died on the cross, really paid for our sins, really was buried, and really historically was resurrected from the dead. And that was a fulfillment of the scriptures, as it says. In fact, Jesus, after his resurrection, he had appeared to some of his followers. And this is, this is the road to Emmaus. He's walking with them. They didn't even recognize that it was him. And he's talking to them about what was going on in their hearts and, and, and why they felt the way they did. And they explained to him about, you know, this Jesus who died and we expected him to be resurrected, but it's the third day and they didn't see him yet. And here it is on the third day and they're headed home. They didn't, you know, stick in there very long. And then, uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 27 says, after Jesus rebukes him, he says, uh, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So throughout the whole Old Testament, it's pointing to what he would have to experience uh, in life on the cross and his death and then ultimately his resurrection. But he walked him through this from the Old Testament scriptures. You see, these, these early believers, uh, early Christians, they, they, uh, they had the Old Testament, but they didn't see it all. They didn't really catch it until the, God started opening their eyes and showing throughout the scripture the fulfillment, how these things fulfilled uh, the scriptures. And Jesus started there, right there after his resurrection. It, and he began to explain it. Can you imagine what it'd be like to have Jesus like walk you through, physically walk you through and say, oh yeah, right over here in, in Exodus. Oh, there there we go in, in Judges. Oh, in, in Joshua. Oh, and, and then we get into, you know, the Psalms and, and even the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And you, he's pointing to himself throughout all of that. And Isaiah and Jeremiah, all the prophets. He's just pointing how um, he is the the sacrificial lamb that he is he has come to fulfill his promises. He was buried and he was resurrected from the dead. Believing in the resurrection is essential to us as Christians. In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, Paul said, If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. 
So it's not an option for us. Or we're not just thinking it's a good story again. But we really believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if there is no resurrection, then our faith, our faith is meaningless. Uh, we would still be in our sins. Last thing here is we believe that uh, by grace and through faith and faith alone, we too will live with Christ for all of eternity. So look at, at Romans chapter 6 with me, verse 5 through 9. Paul wrote this, he said, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been free, set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So in the same way that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, he never dies again. When we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, when we do it here now, like maybe you did it 10 years, 50 years ago, maybe you're going to do it today. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus, the Bible says that you've been united with him in his death. That means when he went to the cross and paid for our sins, that, that my sins really <laughs> were paid for right there. I'm united. I become one. That's where the great exchange takes place. He takes my sin and I receive his righteousness, not by anything I did. I don't deserve it any more than he deserved my sin, but yet he willingly took it from me so and gave me his righteousness. The Bible says in that same manner, we're going to be united together with him in his resurrection. In the same manner that Jesus was resurrected from that from the dead, if physically resurrected, not just spiritually, physically resurrected, we will be resurrected as well. We will live for eternity. Our old self was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with forever. Uh, we're not going to be enslaved to this. We don't have to live as slaves to sin now even. Verse 7 says, we, the reason why is because those who have died have been set free from sin. You've already died with Christ. Sin is no longer our master. We can be free from sin and, and walk in, in the righteousness that God has given us right now. In fact, that's how he views us already when you've placed your, placed your faith and trust in him. Uh, we verse eight now if we died with christ we believe that we'll also live with him and we know that christ having been raised from the dead will never die again death no longer has dominion over him death doesn't have dominion over you doesn't have dominion over those three gentlemen he doesn't have dominion over those who uh, death doesn't have dominion over those who receive the gospel hebrews 2 14 and 15 says this since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. We have victory. We have a future. We have a hope. We have a promise for eternity. We don't have to back down. Where does that come from? Where does that hope come from? It doesn't come from uh, just hoping that God is going to be fair. It doesn't, be, it doesn't come from hoping that he's just going to be nice. It comes from the gospel that is revealed in the scriptures. This is why it's important for us to believe the Bible, but to know why we can believe the Bible. And then to trust what it says and act on it. We believe that this word has authority in our life. And when we respond to the message by faith, we receive it by faith. We enter in to all the promises of God. We enter into the power. We, we enter into a relationship with Jesus. Now, I don't mean like because of, of the power of the, the physical book. I mean the message that introduces us to Jesus this relationship that we end up having with them. That's what transforms our lives. 
when we come into a new relationship with him, we place our faith and trust in, in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. He paid the price for us. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Now, I know there's so much more uh, to it. You can dig so deep and spend the rest of your life and never uh, fully, fully grasp every aspect of it. That's how deep God is. But at least get the Bible in a nutshell. <laughs> at least get a hold of those few things. Well, that's all I have for you today. I hope that as you hear this, you examine your own heart. Remember uh, that this word isn't just for head knowledge, but it's for life transformation as well. And so maybe take a moment to reflect on it. Have I placed my faith and trust in Jesus? Am I believing that there's another way? Am I believing that if I'm just good enough or am I placing a little bit of hope in my own deeds that maybe God's going to let me in? Have I given place to this idea that, that all good people who believe in God are going to go to heaven, even if they believe in other gods? You know, all of those things right there, we should examine ourselves when we hear the scripture. And then if there's any of that, you just repent, place your faith and trust in Jesus. Acknowledge these ungodly beliefs. Acknowledge these lies that you've believed or just misunderstandings. And, uh, and ask God, continue, show me through your word who you are and reveal yourself to me. Well, I pray that God would minister to you, that he'd bring life and strengthen you, and that uh, one day when others gather around to talk about the kind of impact that you left on their life, they'll sit there and talk about your faith in Christ. They'll talk about your love. They'll see that you demonstrated not just what you believe with your words, but with your actions as well. That's the kind of impact I want to leave on others. Well, I can't wait to see you again. If you can make it to that marriage conference, February 20th, check it out. More information, go to tgbchurch.com. Love you guys. Bye.